Thank you very much for that introduction, Sinead. And thank you once again to the team at Engineers Island for giving us the opportunity to present to you today. Um, my name is Dan Wells and I'm the National Consultant Specialist covering the whole of Ireland, typically lending technical, commercial, educational support all the way through from consultant design engineers to installing contractors and to end users of steam systems. As far as uh, support in the UK is concerned, um, we're a team that is 200 strong and we're in an excellent position to support our team in the Republic of Ireland, that's a team of 15 strong, that are able to support you guys on the ground wherever and whenever you may require support. However, we also have got a very, very useful suite of calculators and configurators that are available both on our website, but also as you can see up in the top right hand side of the screen, we've also got the same suite of calculators and configurators that can be downloaded free of charge onto your smartphone, your iPhone, your Android phone to help you with some very, very useful design considerations that you may need to take on board whenever you're sizing a control valve or a steam trap, but more importantly, to help you understand the financial value that's involved in a mass of steam and also, especially as far as this presentation is concerned, in a mass of condensate. So today's presentation it is on the topic of condensate management. It is an Engineers Island approved CPD presentation. So if you uh, contact me by email at the end of the presentation, I will put my contact details up. I'd be glad to share the slide pack that we've gone through today. And I'll also make sure that you get the appropriate attendance certificate. So what we're going to go through today at a very, very high and introductory level is an introduction to condensate. We're going to understand what condensate is, the financial value of condensate, and why we need to treat it completely differently to steam and entirely differently to water. And what I hope you'll get a grasp of is um, why it is the wet side, the condensate side, of the steam and condensate loop that so often causes problems for so many engineers. And um, I think what we'll start off with is we'll start off with a basic understanding of what steam is and also an understanding of what condensate is. So on the slide that you can see in front of you, you can see up towards the very, very far left of the screen, you can see what we refer to as the steam tables. Over towards the far right of the screen, you can see what we refer to as the temperature enthalpy curve. And there's a lot of very, very useful and very powerful information involved on the steam table. So I'm going to take a few minutes to go through these in some detail. Um, the first column that you can see over towards the far left of the screen, it's the pressure. And that could be the pressure that the steam is being generated at the pressure that the steam is being distributed at, or the pressure that the steam is being condensed at in any heat exchanger. And I'm gonna take the example of zero bar gauge, atmospheric conditions to start off with. And the steam tables have got their uh, first principles in the basis that water, which is the raw ingredient of a steam system after all, that water has got a specific heat capacity of 4.19. In other words, if we put a kilogram of water into a pan in our kitchen, we're boiling it away on the hob, we know that water boils at 100 degrees at atmospheric conditions. That means in order to bring that water up to boiling point, that boiling water needs to contain 419 kilojoules of energy. It's that 4.19 specific heat capacity multiplied by 100 degrees that gives us that information. So when the water's boiling, it's got 419 kilojoules of energy contained within it. We refer to that as the enthalpy of water. We can also refer to it as the sensible heat. And that's all well and good, but we don't want boiling water. We want steam. We want that one kilogram of water to fully evaporate. We want that pan to boil dry and leave us with a kilogram of steam. And in order for that to happen, we need to add a further 2,257 kilojoules of energy to that boiling water in order for it to evaporate. 
we refer to that as the enthalpy of evaporation. We can also refer to it as the sensible heat. So when that pan's boiled dry, that kilogram of water has now changed state to a kilogram of steam. And if you look at the final column in the chart, you can see that that one kilogram of steam will now occupy a much, much larger volume because it's a gas now. It's going to occupy 1.673 cubic meters. And once that water has fully evaporated, we know that that mass of steam, that kilogram of steam, will have a total energy content of 2,676 kilojoules. The interesting thing is when the steam condenses, whether it be in the distributing pipe work or at the heat exchanger, it's that enthalpy of evaporation, it's that latent heat, it's the energy that we add to the boiling water. That's the energy that's going to be released across the thermal barrier into the process. So that means what's left behind in the liquid condensate, which is the byproduct of heat exchange, is the enthalpy of water, which is shown in the first column. So for example, the condensate that exists, if we were to be condensing steam at atmospheric conditions, zero bar gauge, 100 degrees, the condensate would exist as a liquid at 100 degrees with 419 kilojoules of energy contained within it. And you can see as we increase the working pressure, the pressure that the steam is generated at, distributed at, or condensed at, the temperature of the steam increases, the energy content that's involved for the water to start to change state increases, the energy that we need to add to that boiling water to produce steam decreases, and the total energy of the steam increases. You can also see that by increasing the pressure of the steam, the volume that that mass of steam occupies also decreases. So just to recap, whenever steam gives up its heat energy, it's the enthalpy of evaporation that goes into the process. What is left behind in the condensate is exactly the same temperature, pressure, and energy content that we had in the water before it started to change state to produce steam. So let's move across to look at the temperature to enthalpy curve. And this is using the example of boiling water in that pan, at atmospheric condition, zero bar gauge, where we know we need to add 419 kilojoules of energy to the water before it's going to boil. It's at this point we can say that the evaporation process begins. And it's only when we've added the full enthalpy of evaporation, in this case, the full 2,257 kilojoules of energy to the boiling water, that we can say that the evaporation process has ended. All of the water's gone out of the pan, and we've now got a mass of steam that is fully dry and fully saturated. So that term, dry saturated steam, the saturated part means that the steam is saturated with energy. It physically cannot contain any more energy. The maximum amount of energy that steam can contain at zero bar gauge is 2,676 kilojoules. But the term dry, that's critically important for steam systems. We know that if we're distributing steam that is not dry, if, if we've got wet steam leaving the boiler, and being distributed around the pipework towards the process, in many cases that can be hundreds of meters in steel pipework. So it's inevitable that if the steam is anything less than dry, there's a chance that we're going to see more and more of that steam condense out and give up its energy to the distributing pipework. It means we've got a significant heat loss, and that's going to represent a significant inefficiency means we'll also need to install a greater number of steam traps to drain that condensate away. That's going to be at some capital cost. And if we fail to do that, there's a chance that any condensate that is held back in the pipework, it can cause a little bit of corrosion. 
any fast moving steam that's traveling across that trapped condensate can pick up droplets of moisture and that moisture can become entrained within that fast moving steam, creating erosion of sensitive areas such as steam traps, flow meters, control valves, pressure reducing valves. It also means if we've got an excess of condensate held back in the infrastructure, any fluctuation of pressure is likely to result in water hammer. A lot of energy being released very, very quickly that's likely to create damage to sensitive equipment. But it also means that any steam that is passing across that trapped mass of condensate is likely to have more and more of its energy sucked out of it. It's going to get wetted out. But the biggest problem by having wet steam or steam that is not fully dry is as we can see on the temperature enthalpy curve, it means that the mass of wet steam that does find its way to the process will have significantly less energy contained within it. What that means is that the heat exchanger is now either going to have to consume more and more steam to provide the process with the required heating effect, or it will mean that the heat exchanger is now undersized and we're going to have to live with the fact that the process time is going to extend and extend and extend. But one of the other things to bear in mind whenever we're considering the relationship between steam and condensate is the fact that the, uh, the mass of condensate that is actually generated will always be exactly the same as the mass of steam that is being condensed by the probe. For example, if we're putting one kilogram or one litre, that's at a volume of 0 0.001 cubic metres into a boiler. That water will evaporate and produce a mass of steam, which as a gas is considerably larger, but it still weighs one kilogram. When that steam gives up its heat energy, it changes state from a gas back to a liquid again weighing a mass of one kilogram and with a volume of 0 0.001 cubic meters. That's why we always refer to steam systems as a mass flow, not a volumetric flow. Of course, the mass is going to remain the same regardless, but the volumetric difference will depend upon the change of state and the volume that the steam will exist at will, will, will depend very much on the pressure that we're generating that steam at. So I want to look at where condensate is formed in the first place. Now we've already mentioned that it's inevitable that we are going to get a distribution loss as the steam travels out of the boiler house and into the distribution pipe work. And in many cases, we can be distributing that steam in the case of large oil refineries or pharmaceutical sites or hospital campuses. We can be distributing that steam a considerable distance. It could be that the steam is wet. It could be that we've got a considerable run of pipe work outdoors. It could be a very cold day. The pipe work could be oversized. But um, it's inevitable that we're going to get a certain mass of that steam giving up its energy to the pipework even before it gets to the process. Now we've got calculators and configurators that can help us to uh, decide what that mass of condensate is going to be with some accuracy. However, for the vast majority of um, industrial applications, it's acceptable to rely on a rule of thumb. And that rule of thumb states that approximately 2% of all of the steam that is being generated will change state to condensate in the distribution pipe work itself. We can refer to that as a distribution loss or a heat loss, um, but essentially that information is very, very useful as it helps us to size not only the steam trap capacity, but also helps us to determine the number of steam traps and how far apart we'll need to locate those steam traps. 2%. However, that 2% rule of thumb apply to what we refer to as the running load. In other words, we expect 2% of the steam to condense in the pipework when the system, when the network is already nice and hot. In other words, when it's been operational for a number of hours. But imagine we've had a weekend shut down and imagine we come onto site first thing on a Monday morning and start the steam system up from cold. That infrastructure is also going to be cold. 
And that means we expect a far, far greater mass of steam to condense out in the pipework before the process gets up to temperature. So we always double that 2%. We double it to 4% to allow for what we refer to as the warming up load. So if we're generating, say, 10,000 kilograms per hour of steam, we'd expect the condensate mass for the running load to be 200 kilograms per hour, but we double that 200 kilograms per hour to allow for that excess warming up load. And that's important because if we'd fail to take into account that increased mass, the warming up load, when we're sizing the steam traps and also sizing the condensate return infrastructure, there's a risk that the condensate could be held back. And if that condensate's held back ahead of the steam trap, it can back up and it can slowly start to flood the distribution pipe work. And when that happens, well, of course, we're at greater risk that we're being exposed to that erosion, corrosion and water hammer. And we're at greater risk that the dry steam that we're distributing across that puddle of condensate is going to wet out and degrade and we're going to get less energy finding its way to the process. And of course, the remainder of the condensate, whether that be 96% or 98%, depending upon whether we're talking about the running load or the warming up load, that's going to be finding its way to the process. So you can appreciate that we've got to use steam traps to remove the condensate from different parts of the process under different conditions and for different reasons. So one of the first questions our team of engineers would ask you if you ever sought their assistance in the condensate removal is, where is the condensate being removed from? The process or the distribution pipe work? And of course, one of the factors that can affect in, uh, that can affect uh, the condensate mass flow that's giving itself up to the distribution network is using correct insulation. So we've got, again, we've got a number of calculators and configurators that can support you to help you understand how we'd be able to improve the overall efficiency of the steam distribution network, reduce the heat losses, and perhaps even reduce the number of steam traps that's required simply by increasing the grade of insulation. But as we've mentioned, it's the process, those heat exchanges, where the vast majority of the condensate will exist. And when we're talking about using steam for heat exchange purposes, it can represent any number of process applications. It could be um, a, a reactor, a jacketed vessel, a sterilizer, an air handling unit, plate heat exchanger, for any number of different reasons. Now, of course, we can also use steam for direct injection purposes, for, for example, humidification for um, a clean room, or maybe for direct injection to heat a processed vessel. The thing to bear in mind is when we use steam for direct injection, the steam and therefore the condensate so it's the total heat as well as the sensible heat will all become absorbed into that atmosphere or into that product. So in situations such as that, there simply isn't any condensate that needs to be removed. But for the vast majority of, uh, of processes, heat exchangers such as jacketed vessels, shell and tube heat exchangers or plate heat exchangers, they're what we refer to as a closed system. In other words, steam goes onto the heat exchanger, the latent heat from the steam finds its way into the process and the condensate, the latent heat that's left behind, it needs to be removed from the heat exchanger. Why does it need to be removed from the heat exchanger? Well, because that liquid condensate simply doesn't have enough energy contained within it to satisfy the heat exchange requirements of the process. So I just want to refer back to that steam table slide that we've looked at previously. We've mentioned the importance of keeping the steam as dry as we possibly can. The reason being, the drier the steam, the more heat energy there is contained within that mass of steam. Now let's say for whatever reason, the steam wasn't dry. You can see in the example down at the, the bottom right-hand side of the, uh, the screen, 
it's showing an example where the steam may be 50% dry or have a dryness faction of 0.5. In other words, it's, it's 50% dry, 50% wet. But that also tells us that this 50% of the latent heat contained within the steam, that the process may be expecting. So that could either mean that the process time is simply going to extend and extend and extend, or it could well be that if there is enough steam available in the network, the heat exchanger is going to be calling for an increased mass of steam. And remember, if we've got an increased mass of steam that the heat exchanger is calling for, that's going to result in an increase in the mass flow of condensate that needs to be removed. So we need to allow for that as well. If we fail to calculate the correct condensate mass flow, we run the risk that that condensate could back up and start to flood the process. So just as dry steam is critically important for heat transfer and estimating condensate loads, you can also see that it's important to ensure that we're, we're venting away as much of the air and the non-condensable gases as we possibly can. If we've got too much air entrained within the steam, finds its way to the heat exchanger, well, that air is going to have an insulating effect. It's going to be a barrier to heat exchange. And again, that means that the heat exchanger will be calling for more and more steam in order to overcome that thermal inefficiency. So one common question that clients would typically ask us is, um, they'll say, okay, you've, you, you've convinced me. Um, I appreciate the financial benefit of recovering that condensate. In other words, the benefit of reusing that sensible heat energy. And the best way that our clients can reuse that condensate is by bringing it back to the hot well in the boiler house. If we're recovering condensate at, let's say, 80 degrees, well, 80 multiplied by 4.19, that's the specific heat capacity, that tells us that we're able to recover approximately 360 kilojoules of energy for every kilogram of water, every kilogram of condensate that we may otherwise be missing the opportunity to recover. So there's a lot of energy in that hot water. If we bring it back to the hot well and keep the hot well at a nice high temperature, there are a number of benefits. First benefit, if we're using hot water to satisfy the water requirements of the boiler, it means the boiler is going to be able to respond far, far more rapidly whenever there's a demand for steam by the process. If we're putting hot water into the boiler, well, obviously, we need to consume far, far less fuel to raise steam again. But there's another key benefit, and that's because condensate has been chemically conditioned. Typically, we add chemicals to the water in the feed tank to scour out any oxygen and non-condensable gases. So the more condensate we can recover, the more cost savings we're going to enjoy. And the question that the client typically asks us is, well, I know the financial benefits of recovering condensate, but how efficient am I? Am, am I recovering a reasonable amount of condensate or have I got a lot going to waste? They don't need to meet to the condensate coming back. We can calculate the amount of condensate that a particular site is being returned by conductivity. So if we take the conductivity of the condensate just before it's dumped into the hot well, if we measure the conductivity of the raw water that's making up any losses, and if we take the conductivity of the feed water as it leaves the feed tank to enter into the boiler, then we can take a ratio and we can determine the percentage of condensate return. The reason being that condensate has already been chemically conditioned. It's in an excellent state for going back into the steam boiler again. The more condensate we're losing, then we've got to replace that missing condensate with makeup water. We've got to chemically treat that makeup water. In other words, we're uh, manipulating the total dissolved solid value of the condensate. And the next question that the client would typically ask us is, well, what does good look like? How much condensate should I be recovering? 
you've told me how much condensate I am physically recovering, but is there an opportunity to recover any more condensate? Well, that's a very difficult question to answer because certain sites will have a lot of those direct injection processes that we spoke about. For example, if we've got a site that's got a considerable amount of steam injection, then we know that there's going to be a lot of condensate that is simply entering into the process. However, if we compare that with another site where there are no direct injection processes, then we should be in a position to recover the vast majority of condensate that is being produced as a result of the steam giving up its heat energy. Now, a good benchmark to aim for is around about 80, maybe even 85% as a as a maximum percent of all of the steam that's being distributed around the site. So for example, if we're distributing 10,000 kilograms per hour of steam, for the vast majority of closed loop heat exchangers, we should be aiming to recover 8,000, maybe 8,500 kilograms per hour condensate. That would be a very, very efficient system. And we want to aim to get the water back to the hot well to get that condensate back at a temperature of around about 85 degrees. If we can hold the temperature of the hot well at 85 degrees, then that's usually a good indication that we've got a reasonably good rate of condensate recovery and that the water going into the boiler is going to help us to keep the boiler responsive it means we're not going to be consuming a significant amount of energy to raise steam again, but it also means at that nice high temperature, we're not going to need to add too many chemicals to purge off the air and the other non-condensable gases. So one of the very first things we should be doing when we enter into our client's boiler house is to look at the temperature gauge on the side of the hot well. As a broad rule of thumb, if the temperature is held there at about 85 degrees, it's a good indication that we can expect that we've got a reasonably good rate of condensate recovery. Any less than say 8 to 75 degrees and there's an opportunity there for energy cost savings. Just look at that rule of thumb in the middle of the page. For every six degrees we can increase the feed water temperature by, we expect that that can result in 1% energy savings. So remember that 85-85 rule of thumb. If we can recover 85% of all of the steam that's being generated and keep the hot well temperature at 85 degrees, then we know that our system is working efficiently. Any less than that, there's a huge opportunity for energy cost savings. So the steam trap is perhaps the single most important component on the steam and condensate loop. And the steam trap is the component that essentially separates out the steam, the useful energy in the gas from the sensible heat in the condensate that we cannot use for heat exchange purposes. There are three different uh, methods of um, operation, mechanical, thermostatic, and thermodynamic trap. So it's critically important that we select the correct type of trap for the correct application. There's no such thing as a universal steam trap. And we also know that steam traps as mechanical devices, they can and, and will fail. Typically when they fail, it'll be down to incorrect sizing or selection of a steam trap. It could well be down to the fact that it's exposed to a very poor condition of steam or condensate, or that we fail to maintain them. And for that reason, clients would typically have a periodic audit to monitor the operational condition of the steam trap population, or they may even have um, a wireless steam trap monitoring device that would identify whenever there's a failed steam trap in real terms. Remember, if we've got a steam trap that's failed in the open position, it's like having a direct injection process that we're unaware of. We're losing that steam. It's going to be vented away to the atmosphere at some point, but we will be failing to recover all of that valuable condensate. So let's look at, um, let's look at condensate in a little bit more detail. We're showing the example of a, a jacketed vessel here. So if we're condensing 100 kilograms of steam per hour at a pressure of seven bar gauge, and at seven bar gauge, the steam tables tell us that the temperature 
temperature of the steam is 170 degrees. So at this point, where the condensate pipework is leaving the process before it passes across the steam trap, the condensate is a liquid. It's under pressure at seven bar gauge. And at seven bar gauge, the steam tables tell us that that condensate will contain 721 kilojoules per hour. But because that trap, sorry, because that condensate is under pressure, it is a liquid. Therefore, all we need to do at this point here is ensure that we've sized the steam, uh, in, in, that we've sized the condensate pipework to accommodate not the 100 kilograms per hour, but we also need to add a safety factor to allow for the warming up load. So just as steam will give up its heat energy and condense far more readily in a cold distribution pipework, the situation is exactly the same at the process. So we want to allow a safety factor of ideally times three. If we'd, if we'd sized the pipe work to accommodate 100 kilograms per hour of condensate as water, then when the system was starting up from cold, we'd run the risk that the increased condensate load would back up ahead of the trap and it could slowly start to flood the process. And remember, there's nowhere near enough energy in condensate to heat the process. The process time would slow down considerably. So the chart that you can see over towards the right hand side of the screen, it's a chart that enables us to size the condensate when it's under pressure on water, as long as we've allowed for that warming up factor. And of course, you can refer to that useful little app that we referred to for assistance on correct condensate pipe sizing. But it's what happens downstream of the steam trap that catches so many engineers out. Downstream of the steam trap, it's likely we're going to see a fall in pressure. In this case, from seven bar gauge to zero bar gauge. Steam tables tell us at seven bar gauge, the sensible heat in the condensate is 721 kilojoules, but at zero bar gauge, it's 419 kilojoules. What happens as a result of that pressure drop? Well, a certain mass of that condensate has got to change state. It's got to change state from sensible heat to total heat. It's got to change state from a liquid back to steam again. We call that flash steam. But the little image that you can see towards the bottom of the screen, it just gives you an understanding with regards to what the implication is of that flash steam being generated. The vast majority of the cross-sectional area of the pipework needs to allow for flash steam. So again, moving across to the right hand side of the screen, you can see the example with regards to how we need to correctly size a condensate pipe work to allow for that expansion of flash steam. Again, you can use that configurator. The rule of thumb, whenever condensate falls in pressure, it does become a biphase. Failing to do that, that expansion is likely to create a lot of water hammer, but it's also likely to place a back pressure on the trap, which will in turn prevent the condensate from passing and encourage it to back up and flood the process. So there's no reason why we can't bring multiple processors downstream of the trap into one common group condensate return line. All we need to give thought to is ensuring that the mass flow rate of condensate, the volumetric flow of flash steam, steps up in accordance with each individual process converging onto the, that group line. There is a formula um, that allows us to ensure that that steps up accordingly, but we can again refer to that uh, little calculator and configurator that we spoke of. So steam traps, they are mechanical devices, they are passive devices. The condensate will only move away from the process in accordance with the steam pressure that is present in the heat exchanger itself. And the steam pressure needs to be able to overcome any back pressure that may be placed on the condensate side. 
So if we've got a heat exchanger that is calling for, um, if we've got a process that's just calling for a little bit of energy, that means we only need to allow steam at a low temperature and therefore at a low pressure into the heat exchanger. And when, if we've got a low flow condition, then, or a low load condition, then it could well be that the pressure that's present in the steam is incapable of overcoming the back pressure on the condensate side. When that happens, the condensate will be incapable of passing the trap and it will back up and slowly start to flood the heat transfer space. And remember, we haven't got as much energy in the condensate that the process requires. So the process, type, the process will go into what we refer to as a stall condition. So we can overcome stall by um, installing what we call a, an automatic pump trap or an APT. And an APT basically works as a, as a float trap. So when we've got a good differential pressure, the steam pressure is capable of pushing the condensate away. But when that steam pressure falls below that of the condensate back pressure, then there's a, an intelligent little switch mechanism that sits in the top of the trap chamber. And that's going to call for a, a, a massive high pressure steam that sits ahead of the pressure reducing valve or control valve. And that's capable of pressurizing that condensate and driving the steam or drive, using the steam to drive the condensate to overcome the back pressure but it ensures that we can drain the condensate out of the heat exchanger under all load conditions. But of course, there's always going to be occasions when we know that we need to add some extra motive energy to that condensate. We need to pump it back. It could well be that we're using the electric condensate recovery pump, as the name suggests. It does require an electrical installation. It's not going to be suitable for intrinsically safe areas. But basically, because we're pulling the condensate across centrifugal pumps, it means that the condensate receiver needs to be sized to allow the condensate to cool down to 97 degrees or less very, very quickly. Otherwise, we're going to have cavitation of those pumps. It also means that we need to size that vent to allow any flash steam that um, is going to be generated as a result of a fall in pressure very, very quickly. So if we undersize the receiver or the vent, then we're at risk that those pumps are going to be racing against hot condensate and they will cavitate and fail. So if we identify that we've got, or we're likely to have condensate that's missing somewhere, for example, if we identify that we've got a very, very cold hot well, then the next place we want to come and visit is the condensate receiver. That will tell us if we've got condensate that's being dumped to waste, over the overflow, or if we've got flash steam as a result of failed steam traps, maybe finding the way being vented to atmosphere at this point here. As an alternative, we've got the mechanical condensate recovery pump. Basically, it's the big brother of uh, that automatic pump trap we spoke about. It uses the motive energy that's present in the steam to push it along back to the boiler house. It doesn't require any uh, electrical installation. We're just using the motive steam that we've already got. But this device works kind of like your toilet system at home. It's slow to fill, rapid to discharge. So that means it's critical that we size the downstream infrastructure in accordance with the discharge capacity of the pump and not on the fill capacity of the pump. But as we've mentioned, we can only pump condensate when it's a liquid. We need that flash steam to be imparted and to be vented away to atmosphere. And it could well be that we're also losing liquid condensate needlessly, either as a result of venting the steam away to atmosphere, or we could have a cavitating pump where that condensate is being discharged to, to atmosphere. But it really tells us that we can, if we've got an understanding with regards to the mass flow rate of steam and condensate, the cost of our client's steam that can include the raw water and the chemicals, the temperatures that we can potentially recover the condensate at, 
And it's very, very easy to, to run a, an energy and mass balance of our client's site to give them an understanding with regards to where the cost saving opportunities lie and what the return of investment is likely to look at. But I just want to leave you with a, 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 a quick energy cost saving example. Let's start by looking at our client's cost of steam. If we use an example where we know that gas costs three cents per kilowatt hour, if the boiler's been badged with an efficiency of 85%, if the operational pressure of the steam boiler is 10 bar gauge, and if the temperature gauge on the hot well is hanging at 85 degrees, well, it could well be that we mistakenly believe that the temperature of the hot well is being held at that high temperature through an excellent rate of condensate recovery. When it, in actual fact, we could be holding the temperature of the hot well at that nice high temperature as a result of direct steam injection. So in other words, we're just taking energy, we're taking steam from the boiler and adding it to the, to the hot well and all the time we've got condensate that is being lost, either as a result of steam traps failed in the open position or of condensate going to waste needlessly. Well, we can calculate the cost of steam in, in an instance such as this by we take the energy that's present within the steam at the generation pressure, 10 bar gauge, minus the energy in the water at 85 degrees. And if we then multiply this by the efficiency of the boiler, 0.85, then we know how much gas we need to consume to raise the steam. And, and then we can multiply this by the cost per kilowatt hour. But remember, if we're using direct steam injection from the boiler to keep the feed water at that nice high temperature due to us not recovering quite as much uh, condensate as we may, then we're actually consuming more steam than we think we are. So let's say we've identified that we can now recover an additional 500 kilograms per hour condensate. This means that we can not only increase the rate of condensate return, but we can also reduce the amount of steam that's being consumed by, by no longer having a requirement for this direct steam injection. So if we can now get the condensate back to the hot well at let's say 75 degrees, we know that there'll be far, far more energy present in the feed water and that we need to add far, far less direct steam injection to, to bring it up to 85 degrees. So in the case of raising raw water, for example, from 10 to 75, you can see that doing this by condensate return rather than by relying on that direct steam injection, it'd save 59 kilograms of steam per hour, which over a year, that's, that's over 12,000 euros. Remember, this is just for an increased return rate of 500 kilograms per hour. It's scalable to whatever you may be able to recover. And that's just the energy savings. The more condensate we recover, then the less raw water we need to consume and the fewer chemicals we need to add to that raw water. So remember, the purpose of recovering that condensate is to keep the hot well at that nice high temperature. And hot wells or vented deaerators, they can typically be only be kept at a maximum temperature of 85 degrees because they're vented and because we want to protect the feed pumps from cavitation. But a lot of processes, especially more sophisticated processes in the food, beverage, pharmaceutical sector, they're now moving towards keeping the feed water under pressure in a pressurized deaerator. The key benefits by doing so, higher pressure, higher temperature. If we've got a higher temperature, we've got a more responsive boiler. We need to put less energy into that high temperature water to raise steam again. But a benefit of the pressure is we've purged off more of the air and the other non-condensable gases that can create a barrier to heat exchange. So we get a significant efficiency and cost serving. But we've still got a lot of clients that are dumping the condensate to waste needlessly, typically through fear of contamination of oils, fats, acids. And um, we can now offer what's called a contamination control system. 
basically it's a series of either turbidity or conductivity probes so that when there is a risk of contamination in the condensate it can send a signal to a three-pot diverter valve and dump that condensate to waste but when it is in a good condition to be recovered it can be done so and maybe even when it is in a bad condition or it does need to be dumped to waste we can at least divert it across a heat exchanger to recover some of that heat energy so i just want to leave you with um, an example of what we call a boiler house energy monitor and a boiler house energy monitor is a very simple console that can sit in the boiler house and it can take an input from a number of different meters typically the fuel meter the raw water makeup meter metering the water that leaves the feed tank as it goes into the boiler and metering the steam as it leaves the boiler house and an example of how this can add value is um, let's say the steam output remains constant over a number of months but the amount of fuel being consumed and the amount of raw water being consumed increases considerably well that's an indication that we've got condensate going missing because if we're recovering the condensate then that raw water wouldn't be increasing and the fuel wouldn't be increasing as we need to add energy to that raw water so the boiler house energy monitor keeps an eye on the mass flow on the mass balance and the energy balance of the system and it helps us to identify very very quickly when we've got energy cost saving opportunities so in the example i've just cited it could well be that we've got a condensate pump that's cavitated and failed that we're dumping condensate to waste it could well be that we've got steam traps that have failed in the open position at which point there's no condensate to recover so it helps us to identify in real time where our energy cost saving opportunities are and put a financial value on them so just to summarize very quickly with what we've gone through today the mass of steam that's being condensed is going to be equal to the mass flow of condensate that needs to be recovered condensate is a liquid but whenever that condensate under, undergoes a pressure drop, for example, across a steam trap, flash steam will be produced and we need to size the infrastructure to allow for that volumetric increase. So for that reason, flash steam is typically vented to atmospheric periodically. Uh, and that doesn't mean to say that, that the energy in the flash needs to be lost. We can recover the energy in that flash and add it to another process. We want to aim to recover ideally 85% of all of the condensate in order to keep the hot well at a temperature of 85 degrees. Better still if we can move towards a pressurized deaerator where we can improve upon that temperature and we can contain some of the flash steam losses. There's a considerable amount of energy in condensate. Again, it's a very, very broad rule of thumb. There's approximately 25% of the financial cost of steam in the condensate itself. So if we've already benchmarked the cost of steam production, then it gives us a good understanding with regards to what the benefits are going to be by trying to increase the rate of condensate return wherever possible. So I'd like to thank you so much for dialing in and attending today's uh, Engineers Island approved CPD presentation. This is one of a series of approved presentations that we have. Um, please give thought to any of the other topics that you can see on the screen. Hopefully they may be of some interest to you.